Um, welcome everyone. I hope you've had a wonderful day so far. For those who don't know me, my name is Danette Fenton Menzies and I am the Director of Learning at Magical Learning. Today we're going to be talking about communicating through disruption. But before we do that, just in case you've not used Zoom before, um, if you squiggle your mouse around, you'll find a toolbar. And on that toolbar, it'll have things such as um, participants or it'll have things like three dots. And the three dots, if you click on them where it says more, you'll see that there is a chat box. And that chat box allows you and I to communicate. Um, and so what I thought we'd do is actually start with that chat box. If you want to say something um, just directly to me or Graham, who's the other panellist, and Graham's there to help if you've got any um, technical difficulties, just click the drop down menu that says all panellists um, or all panellists and attendees. So if you want to do something directly to us as panellists, just click all panellists. Otherwise, share with everyone and click the all panellists and attendees. I'd love for you to share um, in the chat box, just to contest it, where you're coming in from today. And I'm going to put mine in as well. Beautiful, excellent. Di's coming in from Morgan. Nicole's coming in from Bathurst. Thank you, Di. Thank you, Nicole. And I can see Tristan's on there and I'm pretty sure he's coming in from Canberra, maybe. And Sarah's coming in from Hobart. Oh, wow. Welcome. How is it in Tassie today? Beautiful. Excellent, everyone. So it's a small group today. So lots of, feel free to ask lots of questions. And for me, this is a really important one in our series around disruption because it's so easy to misconstrue communication when we're going through disruption. So I've got a question for you to put in the chat box. How important is it for you to be an effective communicator? Not just with work, but also at home. So in the chat box, share with me whether you think it's a little bit important to communicate well, or whether it's hugely important or it's not important to you at all. And I'm gonna put my answer in there as well. Beautiful, thank you, Nicole, yes. Very important. Me, it's hugely important because what I do, though I think it's very important, beautiful, excellent. Sarah, thank you, very important as well. And if you think about it, most of our interactions with others and also ourselves involves communication, whether it's a thought and we're doing that communicating internally or whether we're actually speaking or perhaps texting, emailing, ringing people up. That communication is how we understand ourselves and others. So for everyone, I think it's, it's something that's worth investing our time and energy in learning new ways. And particularly under disruption, we know that communication can be really interrupted. So we're, we're gonna share why that happens and what we can do to stop that happening. So we're firstly gonna look at what causes us to not be able to communicate well. So we end up with miscommunication. And then we're going to look at, well, if I'm going to communicate, how do I empower and uplift others um, so that my language has a positive impact rather than the opposite? One of the things I find as a coach, because um, part of my role is I coach people, is that most people believe that their view of the world is the view that everyone else has. One of the things that we know is that everyone's perspective is slightly different. So if we want to communicate well, it's actually understanding those other perspectives as well. And finally, what tools and tips can we use to communicate more effectively, particularly during uncertainty? And I'll explain why that, why it's different from uh, you know, normal times to when we go through uncertainty, why it's harder to communicate really effectively during those times. Now this quote comes from Graham and my coach, a gentleman called Robin Sharma, and with communication, I think this is really important. With better awareness comes better choices. With better choices comes better results. All of us should always be looking at ways we can improve our communication. I've been a professional communicator for the last 21 years. I'm still learning ways to be good, and improve my communication skills because there's always new things to learn. So 
all of us, you know, we generally we would say if we ask people, you know, are you a good communicator? Most people say yes. All of us have blind spots. And if we can become aware of these blind spots, we can improve our communication and often take it to the next level. So that's what I'm hoping we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about today. So I'd love for you to share in the chat box, what are some of the challenges that you're experiencing at the moment around communicating through disruption? And again, this could be at work, it could also be at home. But in the chat box, uh, feel free to share some of the challenges you're experiencing at the moment. And while you do that, I'm just gonna have a quick drink of water. Thank you, Nicole. Finding the time to communicate. You feel like you're constantly communicating, but whether it's effective, that's actually really good insight. It's going, thank you, Tristan. It's going okay at the moment. Beautiful. Well, hopefully you get some more tips around that too and make it even better. Yes, yeah, so Sarah, that's so important. You know, when, when we're face to face, we see the body language. Now with all the virtual communication, we're not necessarily picking that up. So I'll give you some strategies around that to help in relation to that. Yeah, Tristan, being consistent, die. I have an agent who just won't communicate with me about everyday things that affect both of their jobs. Yes, okay, and we'll come back to that, die, because there's possibly a number of reasons why they might be doing that and some things that maybe will help you in that situation. So when we, when we get a little bit later on, come back to it. Um, <laughs> Tristan had a comment about that. <laughs> so... I really love for you to think about what are some of the impacts of miscommunication generally? So when communication doesn't work, what tends to happen? In the chat box, share, and then I'll stop asking questions for a minute or two. But I love this stage just to really get the why around what this is happening. Yeah, thank you, Di. So you end up with lots of stuff ups because people don't really understand what it is they're supposed to be doing. Dissatisfaction, whinging, complaints. Thank you, Nicole. In fact, in coaching, we have this term around that, and it's called BMW moments. And BMW stands for bitch, moan, and whine with, uh, with the H, not without the H. My husband always says to remind me. So sometimes we just need to vent to get that clear mind to be able to move forward. But where we miscommunicate, we tend to end up with those. Um, situations where it's more negative rather than positive yes yeah, sarah thank you expectations are not met um yes yeah, so and graham's written in there the wine with the h <laughs> the other one we can do later <laughs> um, i want to share a story here and this this is actually a personal story about my family and why i learned that communication and you know dealing with miscommunication is really important and this is my from my grandmother and my grandmother's passed away 20 odd years ago, but this was her story. My grandmother immigrated to Australia with her husband and two children. And while she was here, her mother was here as well. So she brought her mother with her. She had, um, I'm assuming it was letters back then, um, communication with her brother back in England. And they had a miscommunication about money. And because of that miscommunication, they ceased communicating for the rest of their lives. Now they both lived at least another 40 years after that miscommunication, but neither one of them was willing to see that maybe it was just a miscommunication and that they should try and mend those bridges. Instead, they both passed away not having spoken to one another again. Now that gets me, you can sound a little bit, because imagine if one of them had just said sorry, the impact that could have had. And that's, you know, that's the worst case we see in miscommunication, that people just never talk again. Um, and our words can either empower people or do the opposite. And in this instance, it fractured a relationship, which, you know, if you think about your siblings, if you've got siblings, it's an important relationship. And particularly as they were in different countries, different parts of the world. So that's why for me, working on our communication skills, being curious is so important because had they, either of them tried or, or known something slightly different, it could have had a completely different outcome. So that was my story and thank you for listening.
So let's look at some of the causes for miscommunication. And we're going to go through each of these dot points separately. The first thing I want to teach you is a little bit about your brain. Um, just so you understand what your brain does when it goes through uncertainty. So the first part of our brain that is developed is at the back of your neck. So if you put your hand up to the back of your neck, that area is called your brain stem. Now you can put your hand down if you've had it up there. What your brain stem does, it's the first part of your brain that is developed in your mother's womb and it does most of your automatic functioning. So at the moment you're not sitting or standing going breathe. Blood flow, please flow. Temperature, please regulate. Because if we had to think about any of those automatic functionings, we actually wouldn't be able to do anything else. We would not be able to communicate in the way we're communicating at the moment. So that's the first part, and it is an essential part of our brain. Where it is severed, um, that's where people have to go on ventilators, etc., because that's part of that functioning. Now, that happens without you ever being conscious. And this comes into being when we get to stress, which I'll explain in a minute. Second part of our brain that is developed is the reptilian part. And this is the bit that's on both sides of our head and it is about our survival. So if there is a threat, such as where we live, um, in Gundagai, there are brown snakes. Thankfully, they've gone away at the moment, but there are brown snakes around. So we can literally walk out our back door and we have in this last summer had a brown snake right outside our back door, which is how we leave our house. That woke us up. Now, on that, under that situation, our brain wants to keep us alive. So we either fight, flight, freeze, and afterwards, sometimes we flock, which I'm always have to be careful. And that means we come together and we talk about the stress. So that's a physical threat. We also get threats in social situations. So those social situations are where you're dealing with other people. And particularly during uncertainty, those social threats can get triggered pretty quickly. As soon as the threat is triggered, our blood flow moves from the thinking part of our brain to the survival, because our survival is more important than thinking. For example, if there was a brown snake in front of me, you don't want me to go, hmm, wonder, Psh. not a good outcome, because we're half an hour from town. So instead, what you want to do is, because that's what you're supposed to do with brown snakes, if you freeze, they don't see you as a threat. So our brain does that automatically. The last part of our brain that is developed is the cortex bit. So this is where we've got the prefrontal cortex, which is at the front of your brain, which does all of your thinking, your creativity, etc. Now we know that our brain is 2% of our body's mass, but it uses between 20 to 25% of our body's energy. And that is measured through blood flow. When things are nice and calm, the blood flow is shared in the appropriate proportion between those three areas of our brain. However, the moment a threat is detected, whether it's a physical or a social threat, the blood flow is stripped away from the front, the prefrontal cortex, and it is given to the survival mechanism. Because as I demonstrated, it's no use me going, oh, what's that? And getting bitten. My body needs to, and my brain needs to take over and freeze. Now, what we know are the consequences of this shift in blood flow are the following that if you are under huge threat or a strong threat, it will cut your IQ in half in seven minutes, which means your ability to make good decisions, to have good judgment, to communicate, go out the window. And the problem with this is when that threat happens, you change your breathing. So again, this happens automatically in the brainstem. It signals to your brain, instead of breathing deeply, which breathes, it's a calm state of blood flow in all of the areas of our brain. We either hold our breath or we breathe really shallowly up high. And that puts chemicals into our bloodstream, adrenaline and cortisol, which are designed for the fight or flight, not for the thinking, making good decisions and communicating effectively. So you, I'm sure this isn't you, but I'm sure you've experienced people who are perhaps a bit stressed or a lot stressed, they're trying to communicate to you and you really have no idea what they're actually trying to say. If that's happened to you once or twice in your lifetime, where someone's tried to communicate to you because it, and they're super stressed and it didn't make sense, put a yes in the chat box because I'd love to see if you've actually experienced this. I know I certainly have. 
Yes, thank you, Nicole. Yes. Look at this, yes. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. And it is a natural outcome. They will, at the end of it, think they've communicated clearly, but in fact, they haven't. And so for all of us, we need to be mindful about where we're at in terms of our brain. Are we stressed? In which case, we need to really get back to calm, which comes through breathing. That deep couple of deep breaths brings us back to centre, means the blood flow comes back to the part of the brain which makes good decisions but also improves our communication. We also know when threats are detected and the blood flow is taken away, our capacity to make decisions drops, our empathy drops. And empathy is a critical factor in building trust in communication. So if we lose empathy, we become less powerful as a communicator. The other thing is, if we're the leader of our people, so say we're the manager or the leader of our team, our team and us all have, I call them the fangs, they're called mirror neurons. So two fangs at the front of our brain, which pick up what's going on with those around us. So if a leader walks in the room and they look like this, see the beautiful smile everyone's mirror neurons go oh it's safe and they're nice and calm if i'm the leader and i walk in the room i'm like automatically your mirror neurons are going holy crap what's wrong what's going on and that strips the blood flow away gives it to the fight or flight part so people can't even hear what you're saying because their brain's thinking about i need to survive not i need to think and those emotions are contagious so if you are a a leader and you are trying to communicate effectively one of the most essential things you need to do before you communicate with your people is to get really calm and centered and the fastest way is to take a couple of deep breaths or do a meditation now that's the brain so we know very quickly it can move from capacity here to go into the fight or flight part that's different from your thoughts so your brain is your brain, the, the mass in our, in our skull. Our brain, parts of what it does is have thoughts. And those thoughts are both internal and external. And if you think, no, my thoughts aren't internal, there it is. <laughs> so we're constantly having these thoughts. Now let me explain why miscommunication could happen because of this. So we know that every second your brain is getting about 2 million bits of information that's taken through into our body and brain through the five senses. So I just want you to pause for a second. And I want you to listen to the sounds that are around you. Check in with your body. What can you smell? Can you taste anything? What can you see here yeah, all of those senses apparently that's about two million bits of information every second now if we really had to concentrate on all of those we wouldn't be able to do very much at all so what our brain does is it basically filters that information so it generalizes it distorts and it also deletes information and when it does that, it then chunks information down into our brain. So it takes 2 million and through that distortion, we get about 64 bits of information per second. And then in order for our brain really to deal with it, it chunks it down to about five to nine bits of information. So there is so much going on around you, yet your brain filters that. So it's really easy through that process for us to not hear things for us to miss things. And under pressure, that likelihood of missing or misinterpreting what people are communicating to us goes up. We also have a mind. So our thoughts are part of our mind and they are that internal chatter that goes on all the time. We often talk about it as the monkey mind. Now I'd love for you to share in the chat box, have you noticed that that chatter in your mind has gone up since the disruptions that have been happening in the last five or six weeks have started occurring. If you've noticed that chatter going up, put a yes in the chat box and I'm going to join in. <laughs> I love that, Nicole. <laughs> yes, OMG, yes, 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 yes. 
And you know what? It's our brain trying to keep us safe, but it is the monkey mind. You're absolutely correct, Nicole. It just goes... And you know, you've probably found yourself going to sleep, getting to sleep and then waking up and then it goes... And so what we know is that when it's chattering, we're actually not present. And in order to communicate effectively, we need to be present. And I agree at the moment, Nicole, mine's usually about 3 a.m. It just wakes up and chatters. And I just have to go to myself, that's the monkey mind. It's time to go back to sleep. And then I do the five deep breaths. So I go, breathe in for five, hold for five, breathe out for five. So in through my nose, hold, and then out through my mouth. That five times, and usually that puts me back to sleep because it quiets that monkey mind. So on top of what our brain is doing, filtering information, it's also chattering. And then on top of that, we've got our external distractions. So share with me, what are some of your external distractions that take you away from being present and being able to listen and speak really clearly? And I'll share some of mine. <laughs> to-do list is ever growing, absolutely, Nicole. Text, emails, that was me. There's so many things, aren't there, that take us away from just what's happening now. Yeah, getting a bit of life out of the isolation, yes. So there are so many things that stop us from actually being able to communicate well. Now we know that if we want to be effective and less likely to cause miscommunication, we need to be more present. We need to be open to listening to the other person first. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later on. But if I can be breathing beautifully, so I'm keeping the blood flow here, if I can be calm and still, and this is why meditation, deep breathing are important, I am far more likely to pick up what is being said and also what's not being said. I'm far less likely to misunderstand than if I'm distracted, for argument's sake, whether it's internal or external. The other thing um, I'd love for you to share, what other things cause miscommunication? Because I've just shared a couple of things. What other things have you noticed cause miscommunication between people? And I'm going to share one. Yes. So those strong emotions, Nicole, whether it's frustration, anger, worry, absolutely, because the blood flow then is moved from here to the survival. Beautiful. So I've, I've written trigger words, but I love dyes, communicating by text. And in fact, dyes brought up a really important point, and I'll come back to that in two seconds, um, about what's the best way to communicate through uncertainty. The other thing I'd say, just from an awareness perspective, is when we are distracted, particularly external, what we tend to do is multitask then. And the moment we give our attention to one thing and then we move it to another and then we move it to another. So say I've got my emails opened, they blip, and I go, oh, I better check that email, but I was working on a document. Every time I do that, I lose some, I chew up energy in my brain. We call it attention um, residue. And what happens is by the end of the day, if you are flipping between different things and getting distracted, you'll go home and you'll be exhausted. Well, you're already at home, but you will be exhausted mentally because you've used your energy in a scattergun approach versus a more focused approach. And it's why we now know that um, multitasking really is not good. It's not effective. Focusing is much better. Now, obviously, when you've got kids and stuff at home, it can be a bit more difficult to do. Now, I want to come back to Di's point, just in terms of what are the most effective ways to communicate at the moment. So most effective communication is face-to-face, -face because face-to-face, -face, we can see each other, we can hear the intention in our words, we can pick up the body language, and our mirror neurons are basically assessing what is going on for the other person. Now, most of us can't be face-to-face -face because of the physical distancing rules at the moment. The second best approach is what we're doing at the moment, although I can't see you, but you can see me. So if we can do video where we can see each other, 
we can pick up the intention, we can listen to the, the language, the tone, etc., and get a pretty good idea what's going on for the other person. If we can't do video, then the next most effective is audio, because at least then we can still hear the tone of the person's voice, we can hear their language, we can ask clarifying questions. The least most effective, as Di pointed out, are texting and emailing, because when people are uncertain and therefore their brain is firing more in the fight or flight part, their ability to be triggered by words to misinterpret goes up. And so it is easier. I was talking, I was coaching someone this morning and they were finding, it, they were very frustrated. Um, so I use Nicole's word there. They were frustrated because they, their team needed to do some mandatory training uh, because of legal obligations. And she said she'd sent them a text and then she'd um, basically put a list of who hadn't done it out in the staff room. And I said to her, you know, when, when we were okay, that probably would be okay. But at the moment, maybe think about doing a really short video, just checking in on everyone and just saying, hey, maybe you haven't, um, you know, haven't thought about it, but we do need to do these particular training, it needs to be done by this time. You know, thank you so much, really appreciate what you're doing at the moment. Um, yes, yeah, so, so Nicole, it's the bane of your misery as well. So here's a really simple thing, do, do a video, and whether you email it out to people or whether you send it to their text, you know, their phone, a short video is going to allow them to replay the message so they're more likely to, to go through it, but they also get to see that you care about them. So you start with something really simple about, you know, just checking in on how you're all going. I need to remind you, um, you know, there's a couple of mandatory things we need to do. I really appreciate it. You've got lots on your plate. You're doing so well. It would be fabulous if you could do those by X day. If you have any problems, reach out so we can fix those problems so that you can do it by the, the proper date. Thank you so much, everyone. See you next time or something like that. And when we do that, they see our smile, they see we care and they are far more likely to take action. So Nicole, hopefully that was a helpful tip. Um, Anyway, the person I was coaching, they thought that was really helpful. So there's lots of reasons why we can miscommunicate. But I really love this quote by Dr. May Angelou. Um, I've learned that people will forget what you've said. Um, they'll forget what you did. Um, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And this is the thing. When we get communication you know, when we do it well, we empower, we uplift people. When we don't do it well, we have the opposite effect. So if we look longer term, at the end of the disruption that we're going through at the moment, how would you like to be remembered? Is it as someone who communicated and uplifted and empowered people? Or is it someone who stressed people out? And this is why I think this is such a you know, such an important topic. I bet you all want to empower people. I just know you will. But you can put that in the chat box if you like. So let's look at our language. So if we can do it face to face, great. But at the moment, mostly it's going to be via video or audio. We have to be really mindful of our language because first your language you communicate internally. So we know that thoughts create emotions and then create chemical reactions in your body. And by the time you feel that emotion, so if you're angry or frustrated, by the time you've felt that, and you'll probably get, say, a red flush, you've already thought the thoughts, felt the emotion, had the chemical reaction, which is usually adrenaline and cortisol, etc., going through your bloodstream. And by the time you actually noticed it, you've probably communicated and that's led to miscommunication. So when we use language that is more neutral, it is what it is. That's a really neutral phrase. It's not good or bad at the moment, it's just is what it is. Or we use more positive words, we are more likely to uplift those around us. And really at the end of the day, a successful day is when we've empowered others and empowered ourselves. Using words like opportunities, 
possibilities growth to keep the brain wide open looking for those things so we know that when a person is stuck on a problem literally their language will keep them stuck it'll narrow down the neural pathways and they they will be stuck on that problem. But if you ask a question such as, what's the opportunity here? Your brain goes, oh, what is the opportunity here? And it starts to look around the environment for ways to move forward. So really good questions can actually have a beautiful positive impact on you as well. We also know that if you're feeling emotions, if you can label them, it calms your body down and it empowers you to move forward much better. So if you're angry, don't push that anger down because it'll come back out at some other stage. Instead, just like, oh, okay, I'm feeling angry. All right, what am I feeling angry about? And as a coach, I know that when we have strong emotions, particularly the ones that feel more negative, there is a need or a want that is currently not being met. So if you can explore what is that need or want, what you'll discover is that we can solve the issue. Now, I'll share an example here, just so you, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, and this probably, most of us have triggered at some stage during the, you know, being at home all the time. If you walk into, say, a bedroom and you've got another half or you've got a child and there's a mess, some of you might be triggered by that. And you're like, ah, ah those clothes on the floor or it might be the toilet seat up or down or the toothpaste squeezed the wrong way. While it seems like the miscommunication or the argument is about clothes on the floor or the toilet seat or the toothpaste, it's actually not about that at all. The underlying need or want is usually about not feeling respected, not feeling appreciated. Now, when we learn to verbalise the emotion, we can then go, okay, what is the need or want? All right, how do I have this in a really positive way so they understand why it's important for me? Um, and we all have that. We all have triggers, whether it's a word, whether it's a person, whether it's a situation. And if we can explore them, we can bring that around, understand the, the emotion by labelling it, understand the need or want, and communicate it in a really safe way and gentle way as opposed to reacting so when we do this well we respond through uncertainty when we don't do it so well we react and usually those reactions are not so great the other thing to recognize is your language not only impacts on you it also impacts on others so if you're having a bad day your language will tend to go more negative and if you're the leader of a team that automatically impacts on your team members as well and again, they'll pick it up in the video, they'll pick it up in your languaging if you're sending emails, etc. So using inclusive language at the moment is so important. We don't want anyone, particularly team members, etc., to feel like they're not part of our tribe. So us, we, because they're beautiful, inclusive terms. It's not about you. Oh, you're different that triggers a threat in most people's brains at the moment because they want to be part of the solution moving forward. Um, now, I'm just going to have a drink of water because I can feel I'm a little bit parched. Questions about this bit. I just want to check in. Is it making sense for you? If it is, say yes. But if it isn't, is it something you want me to explain more? Just put it in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, Sarah, excellent, all good. Thank you, Di, Tristan, all good, beautiful. So some beautiful phrases you can use to bring yourself back to centred. It is what it is. It's not good or bad, just is what it is. Because sometimes we label things as good and later on we look at them and they weren't so good. Sometimes we label things as bad, sends us into the threat response, and later on we look back and actually it, it encouraged us or forced us to change. So it is what it is, is a beautiful, beautiful phrase. Some other ones that you hear, I'm hearing a lot at the moment, this too shall pass. That's a beautiful, calm phrase, because it will. It will pass at some stage. And the other one is, we're all in this together. Notice that inclusive language. Yes, yes. Notice that there is, there is power in the absence. Yes, beautiful. So I'm 
curious, sorry, before I go to this slide, what are some of the things that you're doing to have that more positive impact? What, are you, what language are you using? What other things are you doing to make sure that when you communicate with others that it's having that, that positive impact? So in the chat box, I'd love for you to share. I certainly use the is what it is. Beautiful, quick response. That's actually really important. So when we know people are a little bit stressed, if we can go back and give that quick response, even if we can't answer everything, like this is what I know at the moment, I'll get back to you about this, calms people down. Beautiful. So Di says this is our new normal, and it is. So this, we're not going to ever go back to what it was. It's now this is our new normal and we'll change again. I love that. Thank you, Liv. Talks about... I have to to I get to. That's a beautiful. When we say I have to, you feel like you have no choice. When you say I get to, you have choice. It's a beautiful turn of phrase. The other thing I think we can really do, I love this, I thank you. I choose to is it so much better. It is, absolutely. One of the things that is not verbal language, but really important if we want to keep our people moving ahead and positive, is to do this. When we smile, if someone is stressed, smiling is infectious. So it, it's sort of, they go, oh, and they smile back at you. We know that if we're genuinely smiling, it increases our brain's performance by up to 31%. In these times where people are a little bit more stressed, etc., a smile can be a welcome relief from all of the negativity around people. Um, so, yeah, that's just something... If you even just concentrate on calm and smile, it's two beautiful impacts you're going to have and you will communicate more effectively. So some other things in terms of understanding why we won't always understand one another is the fact that we do all have different perspectives. Stephen Covey, who wrote Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, talks about one of his rules is seek first to understand before un being understood. If we really want to communicate well, it's taking the time to listen to the other person first before we put our viewpoints forward. Literally, we all see the world differently because we have different values, different beliefs, um, different memories, etc. And they come from a, our lifetime of experience. So no one can see the world exactly as we see it. Recognising that and not insisting that our view is the only view. Because when we insist we believe we're right, we're judging. And when we're judging, we are not curious. It is difficult to understand someone else and communicate effectively if you're being judged. It's much easier if the other person is curious. And when you're in curiosity, your head and your heart will both be listening. So we know um, there's a, a, an organisation in the US called the Institute of Heart Math. And they do a lot of science around the brain cells that are in our heart. So we have three brains in our body. We have brain cells in our head, in our heart, and also our gut. And our brain cells in our heart actually send 16 times more information to our brain than what our brain sends to our heart. So if you walk in a room and you've ever picked up that, hmm, I think the people that are in this room are not happy with one another, that's because your heart has picked that up as well as your brain, but your heart's actually fed that to your brain. They've done some fascinating experiments where they will have photos in an envelope. No one can see it. They'll walk into the room with these photos. No one knows what the photos are. The heart is able to pick it up and the heart changes its rhythm. So when we calm, do -do, do -do, do -do. when we get stressed, do -do 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 -do. and when we get stressed, that shuts not only our heart down, it also shuts this brain because it signals, release the adrenaline and cortisol into the bloodstream, remove the blood flow from here to here. So when we have our heart and brain open, we pick up more, which means we can communicate much more effectively. As coaches, Graham and I both coach people, it is a place of calm and peace for the other person to be able to work through what they're dealing with. And that's what we as individuals all want to create. It allows everyone to communicate more effectively. You control two things. You control you and you control the meaning that you give to the things that you are dealing with. 
So we either deal with it and go, it is what it is, and I'm curious, I want to learn more about the other person, or we go, I'm right and they're wrong. And in that state, we're not going to communicate effectively at all. So notice if you have that need to be right, and we all have it from one to time, and take a couple of deep breaths. Okay, I'm curious. Notice that phrase, beautiful turn of phrase, because the person, if you say it neutrally like I just did, will be more open to sharing what's actually going on, what their perspective is. And just understand, at the end of the day, we literally all do have different perspectives. Two more things just to be aware of. When we're present, we're far more likely to be open to another person's perspective. But the moment you find yourself resisting what actually is and saying, well, it should be different, or craving a different result, both of those mean you've, been, you've gone from being present to either thinking forward or projecting backwards, which means your blood flow here and your focus is not on the actual conversation that's happening at the moment. If that happens to you, wiggle your big toes. Take a big deep breath. I'm really sorry I missed that. Can you just repeat that? And then just listen beautifully. How gorgeous does that safe space feel? That's what we want to create for one another. So I'm curious, what are some of your concerns about communicating through disruption? In the chat box, share a couple of concerns. And I know you've shared a couple already, but any other things that, given what we've been speaking about, that you might have, it might have triggered a, oh, gee, I want to know more about that. Ah, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so being able to convey what you need to convey from the information you're communicating without sharing those underlying stresses. So we're going to go to this on the next slide. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, beautiful. And helping others to get to a place where they can listen. Thank you, Graham, as well. Okay, let's go through some strategies on how we can communicate better. So we can't change anyone else. However, what we can do is we can control ourselves and the meaning we give to a situation. So the best thing is to first of all bring ourselves back to calm and centered. So deep breathing. Wiggle those toes to become present with those that we're talking to. Maintaining that curiosity through asking questions. Notice my tone is really quite neutral. So it's really easy when we're stressed to increase the tone and the actual impact of the language. So what I see when people are really stressed is you'll go from being it's a problem to it's a disaster, it's a catastrophe. Now notice the energy, that's scary energy if it's coming at another person. Pardon me if I scared you a little bit then. Problem is easier to deal with. Opportunity is even easier to deal with than disaster or catastrophe. To so notice that whole, my husband just wrote, I'm running. <laughs> He's on the other side of the house. <laughs> so the moment we notice that that language is getting a bit inflamed, if it's us using it, tone it down. If it's the other person. Again, just going, rephrasing. So I'll say when I'm coaching someone, they'll come and they go, Danette, it's a disaster. I'll go, oh, we've got a little bit of a problem. No, 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 you don't understand. It's a catastrophe. I'll go, oh, that's interesting. What are the opportunities here? And what I'm doing is bringing their emotional pendulum back to a more centred place. And I'm being present with them and I'm helping them to see a different perspective. I was coaching one of my clients last night and they um, reacted in a situation earlier this week and they were justifying why it was okay to me. And I said, okay, 
I want you to put yourself in this other person's shoes. How do you think they felt at the end of that conversation? Did you uplift and empower them? Or did, do you think you might have upset them? And they went, oh, no, I've upset them. So they wrote them a beautiful, I'm sorry, on reflection, I'm really sorry, I, I realised that I could have done that differently. My intention was this, and I will try better next time. Now, they're, they're a CEO of a company, so that takes a lot of you know, guts, and it makes them a really effective leader to reflect and then go, I could have done better. So they, they followed that through. Simple language. So one of the things we know because most people's brains are mostly around here at the moment, if we use complicated language, people are not going to get it. So if you use a term that they don't usually use, define it for them or best case, find a simpler word. We've included in the resources at the end of these slides um, an article by Harvard Business Review, which they released this week around the language to use during crisis. I'd highly encourage you to read that article. It's got some really good tips. One of the other ones is the rule of three. So make sure that there's only three takeaways you're trying to give from your messaging. So if this is a work thing that you need to message and it's important, what are the three most important things that you need to talk about? And then at the end also remind people about. If you give more than three things people's brains go oh now what was number one oops what was oh, oh too hard I don't remember three we seem to be able to retain more than three becomes complicated might mean you need to you know perhaps split it into different messages and be curious through asking questions I also say if we want to improve our communication reflecting each day how did my day go so on a score of one to 10, one being it was a rubbish day to 10, being it was a great day, where did I score? And then look, particularly around communication, what do I need to keep doing? Because that actually worked really well today. What do I need to stop doing? Because it didn't work today. And what do I need to start doing? So keep doing, stop doing and start doing. By answering those and just making tiny tweaks each day, your communication will naturally improve. What most people do, and I ask this question a lot, I used to when I was you know, doing face-to-face -face at conferences, hands up who actively spends time improving their communication skills. And most people, hands down. Because we assume that we are communicating every day, therefore we must be getting better. Not necessarily true. So but through reflection, we can get better. Asking for feedback is another way to communicate effectively. Understanding that not everyone likes the same mode that you like. So if you're a, vi a, vi a visual person, then you might prefer video, you might prefer texts um, and emails. Someone who's more auditory, they will prefer things like phone calls, video, uh, audio conferencing. Someone who's logical will want to see the structure to understand your point. Someone who's more creative, they might enjoy a mind map to explain. So using those different modes to explain concepts is also helpful if you've got team members, because not everyone's going to have the same preferences around ways we like to communicate. The other thing is, and a number of you shared this earlier, you're going to have to repeat messages because people will be stressed and they will miss it from time to time. So if we don't, repeat a message, person, we could have said a trigger word and so all of a sudden their mind's gone off on that trigger word and they've missed what we've said. That's why video is good because people can replay a video and go, oh, okay, yeah, I missed that point, good point. Whereas if we just say it in person, it's gone. And literally the person could have just switched off at that moment um, because they do. Now, a way to stop people's brains switching off, and I haven't got this on the slide, we will share it, um, in the resources but our brain if something is boring our brain goes no nah, don't want to deal with it so it switches off the way to get information up here is through the acronym nip and graham will write this in the chat box hopefully nip stands for new interesting and or personal so if for example um 
we're talking about something in a room with lots of other people, you know, back when that used to happen. And I perhaps said, Nicole. And I said it really quietly, but Nicole was over in the corner over there. Nicole would hear her name because it's personal. Our brain is hardwired when someone says our name to come back to the present. Ooh, what do I need to listen for? If you say, hey, look, I've got something new to tell you to your team, that word new, the brain will go, oh, okay, I need to pay attention. If we say, I've got something interesting, and it is actually interesting, so you've got to make it interesting, again, the brain goes, okay, I'm, I'm willing to put some bandwidth into that. So if it's new, it's interesting, or it's, and or it's personal, it is far more likely to get the message through. So, for example, if you've only got a small team, you could do a quick video um, and just, you know, maybe repeat that video and maybe, if you're good at editing, do a bit at the front saying, hi, Tristan, how are you going today? And then share the rest of that video. By using people's names, it makes it personal. Remember to use that word new or that word interesting because it will engage people in the messages you need to get across. Don't overuse it or people will become complacent and won't believe what you're, start, what you're saying. The last point I've got here, actually two. First of all, if it's important communication, make sure you've had a good break before you actually communicate. Because if you're tired, your people will pick up and they won't necessarily get the message because you haven't got that energy around it. And the last one is a really great way to change your state and therefore other people's states is to change your language. There's Tony Robbins shared an article the other day where he talked about he was in a situation with three people and they were dealing with another party, so another business. And the other business did something which two of the three, including Tony Robbins, reacted really badly. So they got really angry and frustrated. They're like, that's not fair. They're not doing the right thing. And they looked at the third person in their team and they're like, why are you not angry? Why are you not frustrated about what just happened? And the person went, oh, I'm a little bit peeved. Like, peeved? What? And what Tony realised was that if he changed anger and frustration to peeved, because peeved sounds funny, it actually changed how he felt inside. So if you are using the word word that is more neutral, or maybe even a little bit silly, because what that will do is get your message across in a safer manner than if you are angry or if you are frustrated. So peeved, it's a lovely word. <laughs> All right. That's pretty much what I was going to cover for today. So I'm really curious, what are some of the things that you are going to do to work on your communication moving forward? And also, given we've got a couple of minutes, if you've got any other questions, please put them in the chat box. And I'm going to come back to, was it Di who talked about the agent? Let me just find that again. Yeah, die. I'm going to come back to you on a sec too. So in the chat box, beautiful. Thank you, Nicole. You're going to breathe more. That's beautiful. Now, while you put those answers, we are dealing with a team member who doesn't seem to be on the same page, maybe isn't communicating as well. Get curious. So have a conversation to them. You know, I just want to make sure we're sort of on the same page. What are some things that would be helpful for you to move this forward? Is there anything I'm doing that perhaps maybe is a bit of a blind spot? So I'm taking responsibility to create a safe space for them to share what might be going on for them. And there's a beautiful article um, which is on the next slide, which is what your co-workers need right now is compassion. That particular article, I'd really encourage you to have a read of because it's got some beautiful strategies about how we get to understand other people and understanding that basically people are doing the best they can at the moment. They may not have the skills yet to be able to cope as effectively. So part of your role might be actually coaching them. And I'm happy, you know, if you want to um, have a, 
phone chat or something about some more strategies, more than happy for you to give us a call and I'm happy to walk you through that as well. The main thing is to really get curious about what's stopping them from doing what needs to be done and coming from that really curious thing because, you know, maybe they're just super stressed. Maybe something's going on outside of work that's really impacting on their ability to be present and to be able to deliver. Thank you, Sarah, too. You've said, we'll be more aware of your energy, use of emotive language and whether I can use words like opportunity. That's fabulous. Thanks, Di. And literally, if, if we can help in any other, just give, you, give us a call. We're more than happy to help. At the end of the day, this is an opportunity for all of us to step up, to improve our communication. Because what I know is in crisis, it either makes us as leaders or it shows us not as great leaders. This is an opportunity for all of us to use our communication and improve our communication skills in a much better way. So just a couple of things before we finish up. I always like to try and finish a little bit early. I don't always succeed. We are going to put on a couple of new webinars next month. Um, so have a look on our website. Uh, if you're not signed up for our newsletter, you'll get, um, we're putting our newsletter with a heap of resources next week, next week, the week after. Um, so that will also have notification about our free webinars. They're to help people just get, go through disruption. If you've got a topic you'd like us to talk about, please either share it in the chat box or just send us an email through. We're more than happy. We're looking for suggestions on how we can support our community. Every month before all of this happened, we have a free upskilling webinar. And our next one just happened to be maintaining life and work balance. So that's on the 13th of May. You're more than welcome to join us. And please, we encourage you, if you know anyone that could find that beneficial, please feel free to share. So any last questions before we finish up? And I just want to acknowledge You've been such a great group today. You've been really interactive, so I've loved it. So thank you so much. And the last thing I'd say is if you don't have any questions, if you're not following us on social media, if it's appropriate, feel free to follow us on social media. We are trying to put out a lot of resources to keep people empowered and uplifted. So thank you, everyone, for contributing today to making this, for me, a really great webinar. And have a magical rest of the week. And happy Anzac Day too. All right. If you've got questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone.